Hello, and in this video, I want to share a breakdown of the Hulai rock I made. So this is a simple rock generator that I made during the daily Houdini challenge in July. This video will also share familiar approaches compared to my other video about that rock generator as well. So now let's get started. So what you see here is the whole network. So here, first of all, I'm going to just spam a simple point for my placement of the rocks. So wherever this point is, will be my spam starting point for rocks. Then on that single point, I'm going to do a point replicate. This will basically spam a lot of more points around that point. So as you can see here, I spam more points. So here in the first tab, I spam about 50 points. Then we have here the second tab where we define what shape the point should be spammed in. So in here, I set it to sphere and I've also linked it to the time. So dollar F means it's linked to our timeline here at the bottom. So I basically get a random value from our time and the random value, I will then fit the range to 0.7 and three. So a random value normally gives you a zero to one range, but I would like to have a range from 0.7 to three. So this will automatically convert that range here with the fit expression. Now further here also the seat, I have filled in a dollar frame sign. So again, whenever I change the frame number, so if I play around here with the frame number, you can see they will have always different results going on here. You could take this idea of these random frame numbers and implement it into here, the other size locations and so on. And you can get more variation or more specific uh, scattering. Then here I'm going to assign a couple of attributes. So here I just assign a random scale. So I use the attribute randomizer. So I'm going to fill in here scale. I'm going to set the scale in this case from, for example, 0.5 to 1. And we can choose this, of course, like you can play around with these values to get more different variations. Then also here, I'm just going to assign a random normal. So this basically will mean that whenever I copy a model, it will have a different rotation and orientation because the model will face based on the, the normal. Then here, this is a bit more special. I will assign a value here called index, or you could call it variation or something else. And this is here set to the distribution mode, uniform discrete. So we'll basically either have a random value that is either zero or one. So that's the maximum value in my, in my system. Then I will also cast this to a integer, which I will explain in a moment. So the reason why I created this index is in the copy to points, I can actually use this index. So what I did here when I copy my models is, first of all, I use the platonic shapes, which this gives me already like a nice shape for a rock. Like I really like how this shape is looking for a rock generator. This is a quite interesting shape to work with. And then in here, I just use the edit node and just like stretched out the model. So you can play around again with how the shape is looking. So we get some variation. So in here as well, I'm going to use a attribute with a index value. So in here, we're going to create a attribute called index. This is set to an integer and this is the value zero. Then I'm going to create another platonic shape and we will just copy paste these nodes. So it's again, the index attribute, and this is set to one. So what will happen now is that these index attributes from the models are linked to this here as well. So whenever the value of this index is zero, that means that this model will be spawned. So the one here that also holds the value zero. So if I, if I quickly here take my sprite sheet, we see here we have index that either is zero or one. So you can see it's quite random there. And that will make sure we are randomly copy pasting one of these models on the points. So we have some variation there in the shape. 
Now, again, important here is I cast it to an integer because if I don't do this, you will get here a error. So we make sure we are doing that. Now viewing the copy to point results, we can see we have variation between these longer shapes and then these more smaller shapes. So again, I can play here with the time frame and then look for a rock that I found interesting. Like this, for example, is good enough for the, for the moment. So important here is to use this index attribute. So we enable this. We're going to make sure we fill in the correct value here and then it, this should work. So this is the base setup there. Now further here, what I decided to do is use the divide node and I will use the bigger polygons. I will disable the convex polygons. So normally the divide node will make a triangled version of your model. But in this case, I want to use the breaker polygons. So the size here is set to 0.3. So this basically means that I will create some more lines. So if I would compare, it will create some more lines. So these new lines created are then useful here to make a noise. So I use an attribute noise and I will have a scale on there. So we have some random scale on each point now. Important here is to set it to a one dimension and to set here the value scale. We can further play around more with like remapping, setting a different size and so on. Then the trick here is to use that noise value, the P scale value into our bevel node. So what I will do here, I will use the scale by attribute here. So we're going to set this from no scaling to scale by attribute. And we're going to fill in here the P scale that we originally made here. I'm also going to use here the ignore flatten edges. So we only basically will bevel the hard edges. So if I look now at my model, I will now have a bevel that is sort of like more randomized or based on the noise. Like it's not super consistently in the beveling. So if I would go back here to this noise and play around with the size, we can see we can play around with how much beveling is going on. So this can give you a more interesting result and get rid and get rid of the hard edges that we previously had from our input model. So here we had quite hard edges and then we just like bevel them a bit so it's like a bit softer. Then after that I'm gonna do a first voxel pass. So voxeling will basically merge the whole model and convert it to one big uh, model with a high poly count. So for this the demonstration, I'm also going to use a quite low amount here in voxel size. So if you would like to see a high quality rock, I recommend you playing around with the resolution. But in this case, I'm keeping it low because it then cal calculates way faster. Then to continue, I found a interesting node that is called here the mesh sharpener. So this will basically like sharpen the mesh. So if I would hide that node, you can see that this gives an interesting result here. So something I have not mentioned before is that you will need lab tools installed. This is a really useful tool set. So if you have not installed them, please install them. They are very useful. You can find them here under Windows, Labs, Side Effects. So just click that button and you will install them. So it's important that you have installed these tools. Then I will do another voxel pass. So in this case, you can go into a higher resolution. I even have a switch here that I can switch between a higher version if I want to, but just for working and visualizing the first look, I will just use a lower resolution. So this is sort of the base pass. So we have our main shapes of the rock. Then to continue, I will here create a smooth version of my model. So I do a voxel here, which is set to a mid resolution. Then we will add normals and then we will use a smooth on the normals. So here normal is filled in the smooth. So this will make a very smooth result here from that shape. Now I would like to have the normal information from this transferred into my current geometry here, this one. So I'm going to just use the attribute transfer. 
And as you could see, if I hide this, we now have a much smoother result. So the reason why we are smoothing out the normals is because now I will do some more detail pass. So the mountain here, this is actually based on the normal direction. So if you don't do any smooth normals, you will have, for example, shapes like this here. But if you do some smooth normals, you will see that this gets a bit better. So that's just like a simple trick to get a little bit better results. Then here in the mountain, so of course we're going to make sure we're going to set the right height and size. So you're going to have to play around with that to find the correct uh, size there. And then we can play around further with the noise type. So in here I just do the whirly noise, which is often interesting for rocks. You can further again play around with more settings here. Like you can do really interesting things with this note by changing settings. Then you can just keep stacking them if you want to. Like you don't need to stack them, if, but you can just keep stacking some of the noises. And here I have again used the worry noise and play around here with some of the sizes and scales. Then further, I added the normal. Then something interesting here as well is we can do a tri planar displacement. So you can, for example, take a, a height map and make the rock even look better. So in here by default, it will sort of use the checker pattern and project it into the shape. So you can see the checker pattern here, but you can fill in like a cool uh, height map from a rock. As you can see here, I use the texture from Megascans. And then we can get this rock information on that model as well. So you can either decide to do just come, come from here, or we can use the mountain node as well, but this will make it a bit more noisy. So you're going to have to decide uh, which one you prefer the most. So, but this is definitely like a cool trick to sort of get a very realistic result is to just by using already like scanned data of a height map. And this is then basically already my finished rock. So the geometry is finished. You can, of course, take this more further and further. This, so this was just for the challenge. This was made in like under two hours. So it was a very fast rock generator. So what I did next to make it even more interesting or appealing is to give it some color. So I made a small system here that procedurally will add some colors. So this is all done in the vertex color. So this is not with a shader or anything. This is just storing in the vertex color. So first I'm going to start out here with calculating the occlusion. So this is again a tool in the lab. So we can calculate the ambient occlusion. So you will see that some parts are getting a bit darker. Let me switch here to the unlit mode. So this gives a really interesting result. So it gives us a nice variation that I can later use in a mask. Then I will also use a gradient. So here we go from dark to light. And then I'm going to blend these two together with the color blend node, which is also from labs. And I will multiply these two together. So this will just have a little gradient here at the bottom. And we just have the full range of our occlusion. Then further, what I would like to do as well is calculate the curvature. So you can see this. So we have the so we have a variation there in R convex and concave. And we can use that again to color specific parts of our model. Then I will combine these two together. So the, the occlusion with the gradient and the curvature. So we're going to use a VOP for this. And this is then, for example, the result. So what you can see here is also tweakable. So if you don't like anything, you can easily tweak it. So in the VOP itself, it's not that complex. Take my current color, which is the first input, which is here my occlusion with the gradient. So this is my first input. The curvature here is my second input. So I'm going to take my color from my first input. And since it's a grayscale, I'm just going to use the first channel here and plug it into my ramp. So this ramp will then control the main color here. So if I would scroll down, this is the ramp that will control that color. Then further, 
since I have the base color of my object, I want to now use that curvature information. So first of all, let's import our curvature information. I'm going, I'm going to use the node that is called import points. So I will import a vector tree because points have three floats. Then I will have here set this to the second input, of course, and we are going to ask the color. So then we basically split our vector. So we have the RGB channel. And if you look closely here already, we can see that green and red here are the two main colors that are interesting here. So if I ask the green, I know that these are like the outer ones. And if I ask the red channel, I know that these are like the inner ones. So now here then we're just going to use this uh, green and red value to lerp or mix colors with. So here we have the node called color mix. And this is then used to blend between color. So my lerping value or my blending value will basically be that color from the curvature. So I'm going to do this two times, one for the red channel and one for the green channel. And then we just, of course, and then we expose here the colors. So you can just here click on promote parameters so we can access these colors outside the VOP. And then here at the last step, I also did one more color mix here. And this controls how much curvature will be shown on the end result. So because I blend between my default color and this is then the default color with curvature. So I blend between them. So here in my VOP, I have all these colors. So I can control here how much of the green is going on. And then I can control here my uh, the color of the curvature. For example, at the moment, the red is something that I don't like that much. So I can go here and start to like changing this into something that maybe works a bit more on my rock. So let's create some interesting color here. Like something like this maybe works a bit better. And then here at the top, at the bottom here, I still have that slider that basically controls how much intensity my curvature has in the coloring. So I can lower this like a little bit. And this is how I basically got that rock with colors. So you can see that it looks pretty cool with just having some basic colors on it. Again, this is also quite low quality version of this because I have a very limited amount of polygon used. Like normally you could easily take a few million to make a more detailed version because I, if I zoom in, you can see that it's quite blurry and not really detailed. So if you want a more high quality rock, you just go up to the network and increase the voxel sizing of the rocks. And that is basically it for this rock breakdown. But overall, these are pretty cool systems to have. Like a rock tool is always handy to have. And further down in the daily challenge with Houdini, I used later on that rock generator to make other uh, challenges. So in here, another example was the cave that I made. So what you see here, the cave is basically using this rock system, making down, baking some modular rocks and then just placing them around to make a cave shape. So all this takes basically almost no time to make because we have the generator here and we can generate as much rocks as we need. So that was it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it and thank you for watching.